Um, let's go and get started, actually. Um, I want to quickly just introduce Shruti. Um, if you haven't heard of her or her company, Wingman, uh, but she runs a company called Wingman, uh, where she's a CEO and co-founder. And one of the things that um, I'm super excited about to talk about is there's there's a you know a lot of data out there I think on like what people are saying in sales calls and like all this other stuff. And um, what I really was excited to do when uh, we started talking for the first time was this concept of like how can we take like what feel like common best practices that you may have read in a sales book a long time ago or that your sales coach or trainer or that your sales manager maybe even told you that is actually maybe incorrect or might be hurting your closing rate or hurting your ability to get a meeting on a cold call. And Shruti is going to share a little bit more about it here. But I mean, they literally have millions of minutes that they've looked at just in the last year of, of calls, um, tens of thousands of calls. And they're able to like kind of use data to pick out some of the patterns. And what I feel like they do a really tremendous job of at Wingman is like also taking a human element to that data too. I know we've had a lot of conversations, Shruti, about the data and like what you can and can't conclude uh, from the numbers, but I'm super excited to have you on today. Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, excited to be here. And, you know, um, I think as we were prepping for this, there was a lot of back and forth where, um, you know, you, you had some so-called best practices that you wanted to either validate or question. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to be fun. And, uh, of course, I mean, we, you know, we kind of, thought through some of the questions that people might uh, have. And, you know, that's how we kind of came up with the data points, but uh, would also be lovely to hear uh, more questions from folks. And maybe we can do a follow-up at some point with some of the other questions with data uh, answers. No, absolutely. And just a quick reminder, if you haven't used Zoom before, um, I'm going to be fielding questions to kind of help intrude you out here through the Q&A button. So you got a Q&A button, bottom uh, button, excuse me, right at the bottom of your Zoom screen there. Try to direct as much of the questions there as possible so that I don't miss them, uh, so that we can bring them up. But we want to make this as tactical as possible. So she's going to be sharing some really cool stuff. And we're going to kind of pause and see what kind of questions people have. And we want to get to those. So make sure to use the Q&A function to ask the questions. And uh, let's dig in. Take it away, Shruti. Awesome. Um, so yeah, like Jason said, we looked at um, you know nearly quarter million calls and two million minutes of uh, sales calls. Um, to come up with this, uh, we, yeah, the inspiration was a few things. One of it was definitely things have changed rapidly with COVID. Um, so we wanted to just also be cognizant of the fact that some of the data that we are seeing in the last, you know, eight months or so might be somewhat different from what you might have seen last year. Uh, and so, you know, just to understand how the landscape might be shifting. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think um, the other thing that, um, sales managers often struggle with, and I hear this, you know, at least 25 times a day, is, you know, I told them to do this, but they didn't do this, right? And, uh, <laughs> and like, when, when I think about it, it's like, you know, somebody came and told me, listen, if you drink more water, you will have less pimples. Um, I, it, you know, like, just because some, you told me that doesn't mean that I believe you, uh, right? Yeah. And I think that's kind of what happens in uh, sales coaching as well. Uh, I think oftentimes salespeople don't change their habits uh, because they don't necessarily believe that the so-called best practice is a best practice. Uh, and I think the other part of it, of course, is it's not easy to change those habits. Um, I, I like to say that, you know, being on a sales call is like a high stress situation. Um, you have to be reactive. You can't kind of script and have everything prepped up. Uh, and so it takes a lot of conscious practice and effort to make even small changes sometimes. And um, yeah, and so I think it's important to know what are the changes that you should really look to make and maybe what are the ones that you could queue for a later part of the year next year. Yeah, so it's an interesting management tool, it sounds like, in a leadership tool where you can kind of support the things that you're asking your team to do with like data, you know, and you yeah. can find some of this across your team, which, uh, which is cool. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this. Um, so, you know, since I know that a lot of the audience and since, you know, it's, it's blissful prospecting, uh, a lot of the audience is, you know, kind of in the early stages of that sales cycle when you're speaking to the customers. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to look at was qualification questions, right? Because oftentimes you're expected to ask those. Mm -hmm. um, and what we see is that people don't ask qualification questions nearly as often as 
they should be. Um, and there are, of course, some qualification questions that are more tricky that people maybe find harder to ask. And we just wanted to look at data on whether people are asking the questions and, um, you know, which ones. Um, so, you know, we, we looked at overall sales calls and we saw that in 10% of the calls, there is some form of a qualification question. And here we've only looked at, um, you know, the band uh, qualifications, uh, right? So it's uh, questions related to either budget, authority, need, or timeline. Um, I would say 10% is, um, you know, is, is below par, uh, right? Uh, from what people would have expected. Um, and of course, this is across all of the different types of sales calls. So you know that some calls, um, you know, are kind of past the qualification stage, so they they're not no longer relevant for asking qualification questions. Uh, but even then, like ten percent is uh, kind of low. Uh, and so we wanted to see, um, you know, does it actually help people if they ask the qualification questions, um, right? And it. So we looked at the baseline of calls uh, across all calls versus calls where people ask qualification questions. And then we see that there is, a, you know, definitely calls with qualification uh, have a 50% higher win rate, uh, right? Um, Jason, any quick thoughts on this? How would you react to this data point? Well, so I'm thinking about like, why do only 10% of salespeople ask qualification questions? And then I think about, because I create a lot of content, a lot of the advice that you hear on LinkedIn is like, it almost makes salespeople feel bad for asking those qualification questions where it's like, you're overqualifying the person, like prospects don't want to feel like you're qualifying them and like all this other stuff. But the data actually shows that you need to do some of that. And the people that do it have a much higher win rate. So I'm kind of wondering, like for everyone here in the chat, um, do you ask you know, like the very first time you talk to a prospect, either, you know, that fit call, that discovery call, is there anything that you feel it keeps you from asking more qualification questions? Is it you feel uncomfortable with it? Like, let, let us know in the chat, is there anything that keeps you from asking more qualification questions uh, to your prospects? I'm kind of curious to hear like what that is. So Ken says time. That's another thing I was thinking about too, Shruti, where it's like, people feel like they maybe don't have enough time and the prospect's like, well, just tell me, I just want to do a demo. What kind of stuff do you see that people, you know, come across? Yeah, so I think, um, so, you know, if you want to dig deeper into what kind of qualification questions people do ask, even out of those 10% calls where people are asking questions, right? Like a mm -hmm. majority of them are around either timeline or uh, budget, uh, right? And what we see is, um, questions related to maybe need authority, those are the ones that people really, really struggle to ask. And, you know, part of yeah. it is definitely time, uh, right? Uh, and I think one way to uh, maybe handle that is to spread them out, uh, right? So don't ask all of the qualification questions on your first call. Uh, you always have time to, you know, maybe qualify on a subsequent call where there's a little bit more relationship and give and take. Um, I think that's the other thing that managers sometimes don't do very well is uh, split out the qualification questions across the playbook, uh, right? Uh, yeah. So to say, you know what, let's go with these two and prioritize them and then we'll ask some later. Um, the other thing we see is sometimes qualification questions are not around uh, just band, right? They, they're also around deal sizing. And those are the ones that people also struggle to ask um, because those are really about saying, you know, am I going to give you a good account executive to speak to you or am I going to put you yeah. on a self serve flow? Uh, and then people are uh, somewhat uncomfortable with those. Um, and I've seen like, you know, one of the companies that we work with, they, they kind of, um, you know, their sizing would literally depend on the revenue of the company. And it's not an easy question for an SDR to come out and ask that say, can you tell me what is the revenue, uh, right? It's, it's a fairly sensitive piece of information. So I think there's also proxies that people need to find to get to the same answers. Like people might be more comfortable saying, hey, what is the size of your team? Or, uh, you know, something that is also helping you with sizing, but not directly related to a very sensitive piece of information. Yeah. Uh, there's so much there and I'm just looking at the comments and stuff too. It sounds like what I hear kind of overwhelmingly here is that like people feel like they don't want the prospect to feel like they're being interrogated. They feel like they don't have enough time. It's a lot of like, we feel like we're bugging the person. And I think that if you can kind of, 
you know, we got a lot of content, so we can't spend like too much time on this piece, but a way that you can kind of think of the questions like to Shruti's point is like, how can you ask these in a, in a little bit more of an indirect way? So you don't have to say like, uh, hey, thanks for taking my call today, Shruti. So what's your timeline for getting started with our training programs? What's your timeline for getting started with her software? Should you choose to move forward? Like that's a really like very like specific, almost feel like invasive feeling question. You know, you can ask that a little bit differently and say, hey, did you have like, um, you know, any timeline in mind with like fixing this problem that you showed that you had, you know, or the, instead of the, are you decision maker question, it's like, um, hey, can you tell me a little bit more about your team and, and who else like really cares, you know, about this specific thing or this specific problem? So is that kind of where you're going, Shruti? Is like, if we can ask questions a little bit more like that, we can still kind of get, you know, the need part of it. We can get the timeline part of it. We can kind of get an idea of the authority piece too without like being super invasive, you know, with our questioning. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that there is a lot of thought and empathy that needs to go into building those type of uh, versions of the qualification question that, yeah. you know, don't come across as a direct interrogation. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think a lot of teams, um, you know, because they want to kind of keep it simple, they feel that they don't want to over script things. And so they don't want to kind of define like the three other options for the qualification question. They kind of leave it up to the rep to define it. But if the rep doesn't put in the effort to, you know, come up with those non-threatening conversational uh, versions of the qualification questions, more often than not, they will not ask it. Yeah. And Jess has a quick question here. I think that'll give context for everyone. Um, these are like discovery calls and like demo calls that you uh, took this data from? Yeah. Yeah, okay. These are, yeah. These are mixed discovery and demo. We, we yeah. have another section where we are only looking at like earlier stage calls. Got it, okay. And she was wondering, is the, are these like customer support calls potentially or cold calls? We haven't gotten to the cold call stuff yet. So these are sales, discovery or demo. Um, cool, keep going, Trudy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, of course, uh, similar things we see for uh, timeline questions, right? So one is people are definitely more comfortable asking timeline questions, and you also see a 51% increase in win rates if they are asked. Um, and when you look at budget, it's, um, you know, it's also asked about, um, but, you know, the win rate is significantly higher here, uh, right? So again, like, I think what we've seen uh, is when people ask the budget question, it helps them preempt uh, some of the roadblocks that they might encounter later uh, and really plan that deal better, uh, right? So I think this is a really important one that people are sometimes uncomfortable asking because they also feel that they don't want someone to kind of uh, feel that you know this is something too expensive or too unaffordable before they've even understood the value of it. And a quick comment on the budget thing too, is that, I don't know, I see so much conflicting advice on this too. I think it's important to talk about like, I think a lot of companies when they look into software solutions actually do have a budget in mind. Now it's completely different if you're selling something that's like huge enterprise, you're cold calling them and the entire outreach has been cold and you're catching them at a time where they're not thinking about this. But like a lot of people actually do have in mind, some, like especially when I talk to them about coaching and training, they actually do have something in mind that they're looking to spend. And again, it's like, you could ask the question, uh, Trudy, so what's your budget for a project like this? <laughs> or you could say, hey, you know, I know we're talking for the first time here and this might be kind of a weird question to ask at this point, but I'm curious because some people sometimes come into these calls and they have something in mind budget wise. Did, did you have something at all that you wouldn't mind sharing? Like it's a very different way of asking the question and accomplishing the same thing without them feeling like, do you have a budget? Yeah, what's your timeline? Uh, what do you feel is the need? Are you the decision maker? Like, and I'm being facetious when I do that, but I listen to a lot of these calls and that's exactly how they go. Um, it does yep. feel like an interrogation. So a lot of it's like your kind of style and how you preempt the question, you know, that sort of stuff. But this is crazy. It's like, if we talk about budget, it, it impacts the closing rate like significantly. If we can bring some of the stuff out and it sounds like, it'll help us get some of those objections out maybe a little earlier in the process so that it doesn't come down to this like big event at the end of the sales process where we're closing and then we figure out, you know, all of this new stuff at the very end of the sales cycle. Absolutely. And I think the other thing uh, that talking about budget early on does is, um, you know, it pegs uh, the way people are uh, then evaluating the solution because yeah. then through the sales cycle, they're pegging it to say, you know what, is this worth uh, more than X amount for me, right? And 
Therefore, when uh, the time comes to make the decision, they've already been making those micro decisions through that evaluation and sales process. Um, wow. And I think it just makes it easier for them because it's, um, it's, it's not new uh, when they need to finally make that. Um, the good news, of course, is that, you know, sounds like COVID has gotten all of us to tighten the belt a little bit and people are, uh, you know, reps are asking more about the budget qualification and stuff uh, this year than they were last year. That's good. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, we kind of already went over it. Um, I didn't present the data that we got from need and authority here because, um, honestly, the numbers were really small. Uh, in the sense that very few percentage of calls people are asking those questions. And I think uh, that's, you know, that's kind of the broader uh, theme here, which is um, how do you, again, like, you know, the kind of examples that you shared for budget and timeline questions, how do you uh, preempt the need and authority questions, uh, again, in the right uh, frame? And we'll uh, send out like a recording of this to you guys afterwards too, if you want to kind of re-listen through that. But the need piece doesn't surprise me because that's connected to like the problem. And that's what I hear with discovery is like, that's kind of actually probably the most important element is that there's an actual need and, a, and a, some sort of problem that the person like acknowledges that they have that they want to like entertain the idea of like potentially fixing, you know, with you. Uh, so that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Um, and I think like, again, need is um, something like sometimes people will do that basic need question, but then there is so much more to it. Like how do you kind of drill deep enough that you mm -hmm. kind of discover the actual need? Because, you know, customers are not going to come and tell you uh, their deepest, darkest secrets, uh, you know, the first time you speak to them. Yeah. Um, um, cool. So yeah, I think uh, somebody asked us about cold calls, uh, right? And of course, very relevant um, uh, for this discussion. Um, so Jason, I think you had recommended that we dig into uh, some data specifically around cold calls. Um, you know, there, there is so much controversy and there is always so much discussion on LinkedIn uh, that I see around, you know, this is what I use for cold calls, you know, how pattern interrupt is important. Uh, how maybe taking permission is important, uh, yada, yada. Um, so yeah, you know, this is definitely an intriguing topic. Uh, we can't turn the ocean on this one, uh, so we just picked a few elements. Uh, one of those was, um, you know, very often a response you get when you're on a cold call is, hey, sorry, we're already using someone for this, right? Or we are all fit. And um, reps often don't know what that means or how to respond to it. Uh, right, and whether they should write off that deal, uh, move on to the next one, or uh, whether they should keep probing. Uh, right, so the first thing is that we, um, and so the way we looked at this cold call data was, we looked at only those initial calls that people have, uh, right, uh, and that could be maybe a little bit beyond the cold call as well, but not at the demo stage, right, uh, and we looked at not just the close rate, in this we looked at whether or not the deal progressed. Uh, right, so, uh, you know, for example, for a cold call, a success would be was did a demo get set, uh, right? So that's kind of the context of the data here. It's a little bit different from the previous set that we saw. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the one thing that we see is, in fact, if a competitor or somebody basically saying that, you know, we are all set or we already have something for this, uh, if, if they're saying any of those type of things, um, your chances of success in terms of progressing the deal are actually higher. Um, big surprise, Jason? Yeah, this is actually a really big surprise because a lot of the companies that we work with, you know, sell software or some sort of professional service that is very common, like, like a marketing agency, for example. So most of the people that they're reaching out to are actually already like using a solution of some sort. And normally what happens is people get really disappointed. Oh, so-and-so is using my competitor. So-and-so is doing this. Um, and it's like kind of demoralizing for them. And what I've always you know, kind of said was, well, that's a good thing because like that means you're reaching out to the right people. If they're already using like a solution like yours, you are reaching out to the right people. Um, but I didn't know like how that would, and we can talk about how to handle this objection too. But like, I didn't know that that was actually a good thing that if you can get the person to talk about something that they're already using a competing solution, that actually creates a bigger need, I think, to have a conversation with you because they're being a little bit more open 
hopefully if you handle the objection correctly, they're being a little bit more open about what they might like or dislike, you know, about that. Um, and most people, I don't know what the stats are around this. I'm going to not even guess what it is, but I would say a lot of people, when I listen to the calls, like they aren't super excited about their current solution. It's just too much of a pain in the ass to switch. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely spot on. So, you know, somebody mentioning that they're using something is, is a good sign for two reasons, right? One is they've identified the need already, uh, right? And uh, the second is that uh, in some sense, they've taken the first step towards being a little bit more open about the fact that, you know, they're sharing some information with you. Um, I think what is important is to kind of handle that correctly. And what we'll see later is also data related to um, how mentions of competitors uh, impact overall win rates, right? So not just, you know, rates of cold calls moving forward. Um, I think, uh, like you said, right, people might mention that they are using something and then it's important to be subtle about how you get them to kind of talk about their pains with the current solution because um, you know, that's always a very threatening discussion, especially because they know you're a competitor and then, you know, they know that, um, you know, you're in a low trust position, uh, let's be honest, right? Uh, yeah. We've all seen those tables on marketing websites where it's like, you know, this is our solution and this is the competitor and, you know, it's all green checks and then, you know, it's all red crosses. Um, so, you know, yeah. everybody kind of expects the person who's calling to say, oh, our product is the best or our service is the best. Uh, and yeah. I think that's kind of where uh, the balance mm -hmm. lies in winning trust. And uh, I think and a useful tactic uh, there could be to even highlight, uh, you know, what you don't do well versus your competitor. Yeah. So I love the transparency part of this. And just because people are going to want something actionable here, I, I could give you a quick like framework for how to handle like a competitor objection, because like you should really lean in here. This is a good thing. If someone is willing to share this information, and Tony here in the comments said, uh, you know, mention of competitors creates an opportunity to address prospects wish list, increase the run rate, cost savings and service, et cetera. So what you need to do is like, it's not about the logical reason why they should use your solution over the, the other. It's really about disarming the prospect. And a way that you can do that is through like a three part framework. It's empathize and then validate. And then you can go in for an ask for next steps. So the empathize part is you want to comment on what you think they're thinking. Right. And you want to disarm them in doing that. And what you can do is, hey, sounds like you're taken care of. Or, hey, sounds like you guys have put a lot of thought uh, into how to, uh, into fixing this problem or doing this thing. Sounds like you're taken care of. And the validate part is I'm going to let them know that that's okay, right? That they may not want to talk to another person. So I'm going to say, hey, sounds like you're taking care of Shruti. And, you know, I imagine you're probably wondering, like, why would I want to continue talking to Jason if we already have a solution in place? And if that's the case, like, I totally understand. Right, so the goal there, disarm the person. The offer piece is where you could do something like, hey, would it be a bad idea? Or, hey, you know, would it hurt if I shared a little bit more? Or, hey, would it hurt if I spent maybe a minute? I just have like two questions just to make sure that you're getting the most out of this, this, and this, right? Or, hey, do you have a minute or two? I can ask a few questions. Um, I'd really love to hear how you're solving this problem that I hear a lot of folks like you uh, uh, share with me. And you're going to ask for permission to like really dig in and ask some questions. So you could disarm them, empathize, validate, let them know, hey, totally good. Sounds like you're taken care of. I've actually heard of them. They do a really good job. But hey, would it be a bad idea if we asked or if we spent a minute, I could ask you a couple questions related to this thing. And then you're almost like asking for permission to like pry just a little bit into like what they like, what they don't like, whatever it might be. Um, so that's like a little, you know, kind of tactical way that you might be able to step in and, and handle that objection. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that brings us maybe to the next one, which is, um, you know, related to your asking permission uh, piece, right? Uh, so that's the other thing that we hear a lot, uh, right? Asking permission for saying, hey, uh, you know, could I take 30 seconds or 27 seconds of your time? And, you know, um, those type of opters, especially for cold calls. Uh, and so we wanted to see uh, whether those things actually work because, um, you know, I think there are enough people who talk about how pattern interrupt is good, uh, right? And then people who say that having something to, you know, that is scripted to start off your cold call helps you at least come across as confident and, you know, you're less likely to put down the phone just because somebody picked up the phone, uh, right? So, so I think 
we wanted to maybe look at that battle uh, when we looked at this. Um, here is the data. Um, so in fact, asking for that upfront contract and you know to be clear, upfront contract here, especially those type of permissions that people ask at the start of a cold call, like you know, do you have a minute? Can I have a minute of your time? Or you know, this will only take thirty seconds or whatever. All right. So we're looking at that kind of uh, information here. <coughs> And what we see is that it does uh, actually help in progress rates, uh, which means that, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it gives you that extra uh, little bit of time to just collect your thoughts and maybe get you going. Uh, it maybe is a little bit non-threatening um, for people to say, um, yeah, you know, that uh, this is not going to go into a 15 minute call and just be a time sink for me, uh, right? So it looks like that helps. Yeah. So because people are asking what's upfront. So this is, if you if you haven't heard of this technique or you don't use it, and this data didn't surprise me actually, because this is like anecdotally, I, I see this working, but it's like, uh, hey, Shruti, Jason with Bullspool Prospecting. Hey, I know I'm catching you in the middle of something here, but do you have 30 seconds? I could tell you why I'm calling. You can let me know if you want to keep chatting. So upfront contract, sampler okay. selling kind of popularized that concept, but there's all kinds of different variations of that opener that you can do, but it's like right at the top, I'm going to tell Shruti how long you know, I need, and then I'm going to ask if she's cool if I, you know, if I take that time and then, she, then you can decide if you want to keep chatting. Um, so this is cool. And then Raj asked, does progress rate mean getting a follow up meeting? Um, yes, yeah, so that's moving the deal forward, like some sort of next step. Uh, a meeting is, is what that stat um, reflects. So setting a demo, some sort of intro call, qual call, fit call, whatever you call it. Exactly. So the way we qualify the progress is like you know is you know before the call the deal was at a particular stage and today um the deal is at a stage that is later than that uh, right it's not gone back to like you know disqualified it's not gone back to nurture it's not at the same stage as uh, at which it was uh, when the call happened cool um and i see brooklyn also asked something about uh, you know how do you kind of spread this uh, these best practices across the whole team. Um, yeah, you know, I think there is a lot of repetition that needs to happen for people to change because, um, like I said, I think sales is a pretty high uh, stress environment. Um, I think having scripts, having a little bit more structure, uh, having uh, content cards or battle cards, all of those things help. Um, and I think what is most important is uh, to make sure that those things are, um, you know, kind of showing up uh, for your rep uh, with enough frequency so that they are getting constantly reminded of those best practices. Yep. Um, and yeah, I think the uh, the other thing related to the upfront contract piece and the breaking the ice. Uh, with, on a cold call is, you know, mentioning that, hey, I sent you an email, you know, did you get a chance to look at my email, uh, those type of things, right? Um, Jason, what's your view here? So this actually surprised me. Um, I, like, I tell people not to mention the email that they sent, you know, and then I hear a lot of people that like, oh, it makes me feel comfortable when I mention the email that I sent. And I won't, I won't spoil the surprise here. But uh, this this one surprised me actually quite a bit. Yeah. So <laughs> no impact. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think whichever camp you belong to, you can continue doing that. This is not yeah. one uh, that you need to change. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's one of those things. Like I think uh, some reps need a little bit more safety net than others. Maybe when you're yeah. early on and you're calling, um, you know, it's harder. Um, so yeah, looks like this is not a bad safety net to have. Yeah. So if you need it to feel comfortable to mention it, like just do it. And uh, if you don't mention it, you're you're not missing out on anything. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, shall we jump into you know kind of the the exciting best practices uh, which you know we wanted to challenge. Um, and we'll hear what happens. Yeah. Yeah, let's dig in. And it sounds like so, so far, we kind of looked at some qualification questions, just the opportunity there. And by the way, in the Q&A uh, part, you guys, you can upvote and put a thumbs up next to the stuff that you really want us to answer, because we're probably not going to be able to get to everything. But go ahead and upvote the stuff that you really want to hear about in there um, so that we can get to it. Um, yeah, I'm excited for this part. 
Okay, perfect. Let's kind of do this other rapid fire. So we have some time for Q&A. Um, so problem-based selling. Um, so Jason recommended we look at, um, you know, it, it's an important one. Uh, we wanted to see uh, whether people are actually trying to build the repo, ask, um, kind of connect with uh, the customer where they are by leading with the problem instead of the solution. All right. Yeah, I mean, this is like something that you hear preached a lot. And um, I think that there's there's also this like method of selling that I hear about that's like be, you know, talk a lot about like what you do. And like every company we work with talks a lot about like the solution. It's a lot of like, here are all the features and how it's going to save you time and money. Um, and they completely gloss over to like, how is this connected to a problem? You know that the person is having. So this is something I'm, I feel very, very strongly about. And how often do you think this happens, Jason? Ooh. I mean, this might be. I'm guessing it's okay. Three point six percent of the time. Wow. Okay. I thought I was going to say around five or ten percent of the time. I think that people probably really dig into problems during the sales calls. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, honestly, we're not even like. Uh, you know, further bifurcating this to say how often are people really digging into it versus just mentioning that this is a problem or this is a challenge that we solve. Yeah. Um, and I would say that this uh, was really, really low in my opinion. Um, you know, and uh, and I think that, uh, of course, like if you were to present this data to your reps, um, the other thing that you would want to present is um, how does this impact win rates, right? And these are not... Yeah just rates on the deal moving forward, but this is uh, actually rates of the deal closing, uh, right? And so, you know, stock increase. Um, honestly, if as a rep, I saw this data, uh, I would be kicking myself for not uh, leading more with problems. And John asks, what's the other 96.4% doing? Well, <laughs> I, I can just look at Trudy. What, you know, how would you describe the last 10 demo calls that you've been on? What is the content of those demo calls? Yeah, I think, you know, I think it, it's the same thing. Like people are too hesitant to, like they feel that they don't want to be imposing on your time. Uh, and so they kind of want to jump straight into the solution. Yeah. Uh, right. And that's, that's kind of what they're doing. Um, a lot of times, I think the excuse that people make to themselves is, uh, listen, if the person showed up as an inbound lead, the chances are they already know what the problem is. Uh, right, or what problem we uh, help solve. Uh, but I think that the framing really helps uh, because that can help you, um, you know, through that qualification and discovery process of making sure that, um, you know, everybody's aligned and um, they know why they are on that call. Yeah, I, the, my experience reflects the same exact thing. I, I can think of all the demos that I've been on actually in the last three or four years, only one of them only one demo call ever have I participated in where the person actually asked me around like, how are you taking care of this right now? Like what's the most frustrating part of, of doing it that way right now? Or how's that impacting your business? One time, everyone else goes straight to like, um, they go through each of the features individually of the product or service that they're selling. Here are the three things. Here are the three reasons why people hire us or use our solution. There's like no connection at all. So this, the fact that it's so low is kind of surprising, but I thought it would definitely be around like 10% or lower. Yeah. Um, yeah, the good news seems to be that maybe people are picking up more on this. Uh, again, this is, you know, very point-based data. Um, so we kind of need to see a longer trend. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe COVID has again sharpened our knives on this one. <coughs> Um, so the other thing that we hear is, um, you know, always be closing, uh, right? Which is trying to move things towards a commitment, towards a very concrete, um, like, you know, contract, POC, those type of things. Um, and so we wanted to see what that language translates into. Um, so clearly refs are much more uh, prone to doing this than they were to talking about problems and challenges that they solve. Um, any surprises there? Yeah, I'm surprised this this one is uh, this uh, like isn't higher. <laughs> this is like the still it's such old school advice, but it's still something I hear a lot of sales leadership like, dude, always be closing, always ask for the sale, 
always ask for the next appointment. Like always ask, 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 like make constant ask. Um, yeah, I mean, this one's definitely higher. I'm surprised it's not higher <laughs> than 21%. <laughs> so it's actually, uh, this doesn't include people just asking for a next step and we'll see the data on that. Uh, oh, okay. Later. So this is just purely closing and asking. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. asking for contract, like, you yeah. know, can I send you a, you know, DocuSign, contract, those type of language. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, and I guess this is maybe not as surprising, right? Like where you see those things being mentioned uh, also in some sense already means that, you know, the conversations are a little bit more advanced, uh, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you definitely see a higher win rate here. Um, you know, I think one thing in general to be aware of when you're looking at any data is, you know, correlation versus causation, uh, right? Yeah. So just because uh, this is happening, you can't say that this is the reason for why, uh, and, you know, of course, we, we can make that argument for any of the data points that we look at, uh, but I think especially for this one, it's, uh, it's kind of a little bit trickier. Um, I think the other thing that uh, reps need to remember from here is while uh, the wind rates are higher, um, you know, the wind rates, um, and again, just to give everyone a reference point, right, uh, the baseline wind rates uh, for all deals that you're seeing here is around six um, percent, um, you know, five and a half to six percent. And so, um, you know, even in the case where people are talking about closing signals, the win rates are, of course, uh, you know, still in the kind of ten percent ballpark. Um, so it still doesn't mean that just because you spoke about a contract, uh, your deal is going to go through. Yeah. Yeah, and just to give other people some. Uh, clarification as well, because Brandon's asking about like the types of sales calls. Is this kind of a mix of people selling stuff that's transactional versus enterprise? Like, is there kind of everything mixed into this? Um, it is everything mixed into it. I would say that just in terms of volumes, it's dominated by, um, you know, uh, like the double thousand dollar, like, you know, somewhere between the 22 uh, eighty thousand dollar kind of range of deals. Yeah. Uh, right. Those are good sized um, deals. I don't. Enterprise. Yeah, I don't consider that <laughs> transactional. Um, transactional to me is stuff that's like you know ten thousand dollars, um, ten to twenty thousand dollars or less. Stuff that you don't need like very much signing uh, from the from your prospects. You don't need too many people to sign off on it. Um. So yeah, it's a mix. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, so the other one that I am uh, very fond of is customer stories. Um, I think it's super important if people can um, tell a good story. Uh, it helps with many things. Uh, one is, of course, using that as a way to build trust, but I think also using that as a way to highlight uh, the problem that the uh, tool solves, all right, in a more uh, kind of non salesy friendly manner. Um, and what is disappointing, but not surprising, at least in my mind, is that um, you know this happens in very, very, very few calls. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> um, you know, if I were to take a guess why this happens so less is uh, because I think uh, very often the reps, like some of the deals that you want the reps to talk about are not necessarily the deals that they have closed. Right, so their ability to kind of weave that into a story is limited. Um, what do you think, Jason? Any any reasons you can think of why reps don't do this more often? Uh, I think that they're really uncomfortable with it um, because most of them, like like you talked about, I, I think they don't have a framework to tell the story with, and I think they also like are thinking about like how specific this needs to be to the prospect, and it's like really familiarizing yourself with like. Um, I think really low hanging fruit opportunity for you is if you haven't checked out and like really read in depth every one of your company's case studies, like you should have one to two customers in mind, even if they're not ones that you personally closed or set appointments for that you can reference in at any given time. So I think like having the information available is one part of it and then having a framework that you feel comfortable like no one is really teaching from what I experience in the companies I work with like, how do I tell a story. How do I tell that customer story in 30 seconds, 60 seconds, you know, versus, yeah, so we worked with this company. It was really awesome. They had this problem. We fixed it for them. It's, it's super cool. Like it needs to be more in depth and like more, like, how do you connect that back to like 
the prospect that you're talking to. So I, I think it's a skill thing in my experience. Absolutely. And I think as uh, maybe managers think about their SKOs this year, uh, maybe that's something that they should pay attention to. Maybe it's a good opportunity to bring your customers yeah. to get them to tell their own stories. Yeah. Um, yeah, and not a surprise here. It definitely helps improve win rates. Um, I think this actually, um, you know, is important, um, especially even more so for services businesses where, um, you know, the customer story is really uh, your biggest way to build trust and uh, make yourself stand out. Yep. And this data too, because some people are asking, this is across, I know, North America, and then what other like countries and stuff uh, do you guys have your customers in? Just so people can get an idea um, of like where the data is kind of collected. Yeah, so I would say it's like 85% or so North America, um, right? And then yeah. um, maybe the rest of it is split across half Europe and half, um, you know, Asia Pacific, yeah. more like Southeast Asia and India. But gotcha. literally like a majority and overwhelming majority is just North America. Yeah, gotcha. Um, yeah, so I think this is the other one that you were mentioning, Jason. Um, you know, do people, um, do reps set up next steps? And like, I think everybody goads them to. Um, and so I think this one would be a nice surprise. And uh, so just to set context, right, like here we are looking at calls that are a little bit longer. Uh, right, so these are typically, you would assume, late stage calls, like 15, 20 minutes or more. Um, and so what we see here is um, that, you know, in 90% of the cases, people are setting up next steps, or at least the reps are asking for next steps, uh, right? They're yeah. having that conversation. Um, and it doesn't seem to impact win rates, right? I think that's largely because it's happening pretty much in every call anyways, uh, right? So, you know, the baseline isn't very different. Um, so yeah, I think managers can relax on that a little bit. I think reps have gotten that message, right? Yeah. What does the next slide say? Yeah, I think this is the really important part here is like it. So what you're saying is Shruti, correct me if I'm wrong here, is that talking about next steps, we're not saying that that's not important to do. What we're saying is that like your focus, like, cause there's so much of it on like secure next steps, secure next steps. Like the other stuff that you should actually be thinking about that has a higher correlation with the closing rate is those qualifica uh, qualification you know, areas. Like, is there a clear need here? Like, is there a timeline that there, like, is there urgency? Um, do the, are you talking to the right people? Like, have you had the budget conversation yet? Like those are actually higher indicators of close rates and wins rate, win rates than just next steps. And people are like 91% of people are already doing a good job of next steps anyways. So like, don't, don't focus, don't make that yeah. the entirety of the focus, I think is kind of the takeaway here, if I'm understanding correctly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think as a manager, like the takeaway broadly overall is to say, listen, can I pick one theme that I want my team to improve on, you know, maybe this month? Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, and because it's really hard for people to kind of change five things at the same time, right? Uh, and so it's important to kind of pick what those three things are for this quarter and then, you know, have a right sequence to it. And, you know, next steps would make that cut for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Jason, I know we're kind of, um, you know, running out of time. Do you want me to maybe skip through some of the stuff or should we just do this really quickly? Uh, let's go through pricing and then let's get to some questions. Yeah, okay. I think the pricing one is pretty cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, what is this happens really, really often in calls. And I think uh, the, very often I hear managers telling their reps that, hey, I don't want you to discuss pricing. I want you to leave this to the A or to a later stage or, uh, you know, you need to have done A, B, and C before you are okay to talk about pricing. Um, and, you know, Honestly, the thing is none of us would buy things without knowing uh, a reference price. Like I understand in some cases it's hard to tell a direct price. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important for uh, organizations to figure out how they want their reps to handle pricing, um, you know, even if they don't want them to reveal it very early on. Um, I absolutely hate it. And I've heard this in so many calls, uh, people saying, sorry, I'm not authorized to talk about pricing. 
which I think is uh, just just not the response that yeah. uh, a prospect would want to hear. Yeah, d definitely not. <laughs> I can share that with you. You're going to have to wait until next week when you can meet with my AE. <laughs> In the meantime, I'm going to go to your competitors and if they're easy to, easier to work with and I can get the pricing I need, I might be more likely to just go, go with them instead. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, and I think that was the verdict on pricing. I'll skip through the competitors a bit, but um, and then I can skip through this as well. But I think there was one that you wanted to talk about, yeah, which was- Yeah, definitely this one, uh, yeah to talk to listen ratio. Um, so, you know, I think everybody has been told, you know, you have one mouth and two ears, and so listen more and talk less. Um, you know, I think broadly that sounds sensible. Um, so we looked at the data and what we did was we um, categorized calls into, you know, things where a rep spoke for less than 50% of the time, things where the rep spoke for between 50 to 65 percent of the time and then uh, calls where the rep spoke for more than 65 percent of the time um, and we found a big fat zero as a difference in terms of win rates um, so that was actually pretty shocking to me myself yeah. uh, because I think we all uh, have been led to believe so much that this has a big impact um, and of course I would take this data with a large pinch of salt because a um, couple of reasons, right? One is uh, different sales processes have different requirements. If you have a really complex product, you need to maybe talk and make sure that your uh, prospect understands what it does, uh, right? Um, I think that there are, again, like certain exceptions to uh, the, you know, talk less, listen more rule. Um, but yeah, overall, the data is what it is. Yeah, this one was a huge surprise to me because like, I think that a lot of people when they're coaching, including me, would look at like talk to listen ratio as like a leading indicator for something. And it's actually like you see a really interesting range where like sometimes like you have reps with high closing rates that do a lot of talking, like they might talk like 70% of the call, but they're really good at getting asking questions and digging into the things and talking about what the prospect wants to hear about, you know, and then you get people that don't talk very much at all. And like that, so I fit in that category. That was an interesting, cause I use wingman. Like I talk about 30% of the time through the sales process, you know? And I was freaking out because I'm like, should I be talking more? Because like the, what I hear is that it should be split or maybe I should be talking. Like, I didn't really know what the baseline should be. And like, this is pretty comforting knowing that like, hey, do you look like with very rare exception, like you don't really need to pay close attention to this. It's more like, again, like coming back to you know, budget, authority, need, timeline, and like this, the big one being need, like, is there a problem here that they feel like it's worth fixing? And do you have a conversation about that? And, and don't worry so much about how much they're talking versus how much you're talking. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Not everything that is being said, and I think Raj said this, like not all words carry equal weight. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's exactly uh, what happens, which is, um, you know, some people, and you, you made a great point, some people are really good at anticipating um, yep. the customer's needs, and therefore they're really good at saying the right thing. Uh, but I think maybe if you're starting out and, you know, unless you're selling something that's super complex, maybe it is a good practice to make sure that you leave some bandwidth and space for uh, doing the discovery and asking the questions. Um, because I've also seen reps go uh, completely in the other direction, right, and not be responsive to whether or not the other party is even interested in listening, um, yeah. right, and they just ramble on. Yeah. Great. Uh, before we get to some of these questions, I want to share something, like, where can people go to learn more about Wingman? And then I want to share, we got, like, a Black Friday deal I wanted to share with everyone as well. But where's the best place if someone's thinking, like, all of this sounds really good, Shruti, how could I capture some of this data like for my team specifically or even for myself? Um, can you tell us a little bit more about like what Wingman does and like where people can go to check that out? Sure, so Wingman, um, you know, plugs into different uh, types of conversations across dialers, video calls like this one, um, and, you know, takes the data, uh, transcribes it and then makes sense out of it. Uh, and also then correlates that with your outcomes from your CRM data. Um, you know, you can, of course, uh, learn more about us on the website, uh, www.trywingman.com. Um, maybe I'll just put the link. In I got the a chat short link, well. actually. I'll throw into the chat there. 
Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and uh, you know, the other thing that I really want to make sure is uh, when I started this out, I wanted to make sure that uh, this is a tool uh, that's a wingman for salespeople. So we also do a lot of things that help and support salespeople while they are in the call. Um, mm. So you know, they can get prompts and their personalized cues. Um, so you know, if you if you say a lot of does that make sense and you want to get over that habit, it's going to like knock that into you uh, right there as you make that mistake. Um, so yeah, there's, there's also a lot of cool stuff that we do in real time. Yeah, I definitely recommend checking out. I mean, it was so cool, like during my discovery calls and I don't do a demo necessarily where I talk about a product, but I kind of demo and walk through our coaching programs. And it was kind of cool because I get little cues if I was talking too much or I get little cues if the prospect brought up a specific talking point around my competitors, let's say, and it would give me some talking points that I have. Um, but I want to share this with you guys too. So if you go to that link, blissfulprospecting.com slash wingman, I put it in the chat. There's actually a Black Friday deal. Um, if you're interested, if you use the coupon code JBay, you get 50% off your first six months. And it's super affordable, um, especially for individuals. Uh, so I would definitely check it out. Um, Trudy, this has been awesome. We got a couple more minutes here. I figured I want to get this in uh, before people have to take off for their meetings, but we got uh, probably time for a question or two. And it looks like the question uh, Tom Laker asks is the most upvoted. What is the nicest way to ask about their budgets? Um, I'll let you go first on this, Shruti, and I have some thoughts on it, but budgets. We need to ask about it. What's a, what's a good way to ask? Yeah, I think uh, one way to ask about the budget is uh, to actually help quantify the extent of the problem, uh, mm -hmm. right? And uh, basically to kind of say, okay, you know what, um, you know, what is the size and magnitude of the problem? Like how much money are you losing mm -hmm. on this or how much time and how, how does that uh, you know, kind of relate to in terms of money? Uh, and get them to kind of talk that through, uh, right? But the other part of the budget is, of course, um, uh, you know, are they, uh, you know, the, the reason why they're dissatisfied with their status quo, uh, right? And that I think often becomes uh, their benchmark for the budget. And so to kind of understand what the status quo looks like. Um, but I think if you want to directly ask about budget, I think, um, you know, the preemptive approach that you suggested uh, was good and I would let, let you take that. Yeah, if you can kind of let them know, like, because you feel awkward asking for it, you could just say something kind of along those lines, like, hey, I, I know it might feel like I'm kind of prying, but and the reason I'm asking is that, like, a lot of people kind of come into these calls, like, with a budget in mind of, like, what they're looking to spend, and uh, you may or may not have that ready, but I was curious, but did you have something, like, specific in mind budget-wise? Like, that's a really, like, easy, simple way that you can ask it. You're giving them the reason why you're asking it, and you're kind of removing the weirdness you know, from asking that uh, question, you can literally do that with any part of like, if you're using Bant or some people use MedPick or Medic or whatever other, you know, methodology you're using, if you could kind of preempt the qualification questions with like a reason why you're asking it and let people know that like, hey, a lot of times people do come in with that stuff. It makes asking the question like, like way easier. Um, hopefully that helps you, Tom. Uh, great question. Uh, I think we got time here for one more so Shane Martin asks, what are the top three qualification questions to ask if you're selling professional services? Well, I mean, we gave you one of them there with budget. Is there any insight you have around like maybe authority? Like we could do the authority one next. Um, and we did kind of talk about this a little bit earlier, but any, anything that you could share there, Shruti, that you see with like your guys' customers and how they you know, sort of ask the authority questions and, and poke and prod yeah. <laughs> in that area? <laughs> Um, yes, I think one way people ask is, hey, is there anyone else that needs to be involved or, you know, would you like to invite someone to our next meeting, um, yeah. right? Um, and I think that kind of gives them an easy way to kind of, you know, get more people involved. Um, the other way people sometimes ask that softly is uh, by just saying, you know, that I'm going to send you this information at the end of the uh, meeting. Um, you know, is there someone else from your team that you'd like me to copy on that, right? Like, so that's kind of some of the softer approaches. Um, honestly, I've also seen people, um, you know, straight up ask the question of saying, hey, um, you know, what does your, uh, you know, what does your purchase process look like? Or, you know, mm -hmm. if you've bought this tool in the past or, you know, something similar in the past, then how, um, you know, how did that approval process go? And I think that's pretty typical to ask if you're doing an enterprise deal, it's not, 
Um, and yeah. I think generally, if you're doing a larger uh, deal, I think people expect those questions. Uh, but yeah, they can come across uh, a bit um, crying if you're asking them early on. Um, and I think it's also important to do some research to make sure that you're not asking an authority question to like, you know, somebody who clearly has the authority. Like if you're speaking to the CEO, you don't need to ask them, like, do you have the yeah. authority to make the decision? Yeah, I think you mentioned a really good point there is if you can kind of like come in to the uh, discovery call and you've already kind of done research on the company, so you kind of know who would probably be involved. You can also be a little more specific and say, uh, you know, hey, I noticed that so-and-so also works with you on the marketing team. It's like, um, is this problem affecting them as well? Or how, how do you think that this problem is affecting or them? Or, or what do you think that they would have to say about, you know, this problem? Or what are their thoughts on this kind of thing? So if you can like really use the need um, aspect as a way to kind of drive the conversation around the authority. Um, another really simple question, you kind of alluded to this too, is just, hey, can you tell me a little bit more about your team? Like who, who else do you work with on this? And it's like, you're just kind of getting an idea of like who they work with, who else might be involved, et cetera. Um, that's all we got time for you guys. Um, I'll send this recording out um, to everyone afterwards so that we have it. Um, but Shruti, thank you for spending time with us today. This is this was awesome. There was a lot of stuff today that I uh, learned and I already kind of poked through a little bit of the data, but there was a few surprises in there that were, that were super cool. And I appreciate you gathering all that information and sharing it with us. No, oh, this was great. And thanks for being such an interactive audience. I love this. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for the participation, everyone. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Have a good rest of your week. We'll see you. Looks like a lot of people want to gift you a poster, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it responded to my email that I sent out after this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Later, Shruti. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>